Hey there, this is the one boom and this video is entirely about skill because who better to talk about that than somebody with very little. I'm like the everyman, I'm somebody who can play a game well but isn't well at many games, which allows me to have unique perspectives like the ones you're about to hear and likely subscribe for. Anyway, thank you guys for coming to my baby. Anyway, let's roll the footage. What are you doing? Don't attach my name to this. There's always so much squabbling and arguing about skill this and skill that, but the topic always ends up boring me to tears. So in this video, we're gonna break down some of the most common topics surrounding skill and why I think most of them are a waste of perfectly good air. Towards the end of the video though, I'm gonna talk about what skill means to me and why I do think it is, at the end of the day, a very important topic as long as it's handled in a certain way. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is relative skill. Essentially, every video game requires players to learn a set of relative skills, utilizing the toolbox, mastering controls, practicing for perfection, and understanding the meta is something you have to do in every single game if your goal is to succeed at that game. Saying one game takes more skill than another has only ever made sense in the context of what would I rather spectate, at least in my opinion. I mean, saying that X game takes more skill compared to Y game to tear someone else down or to make fun of another franchise or whatever, when the entire video game medium is about people indulging their interests and it seems just so pointless at best or annoying at worst. Like me personally, I think Halo generally takes more skill than Call of Duty, but that never bothers me when I'm sucking or succeeding at Halo and Call of Duty. Because when I'm playing COD, I'm not worrying about the skill that Halo requires and vice versa. They're their own games. One might have a lower skill floor and a higher skill ceiling or vice versa and again, I just don't care. Once I'm in, I'm subjected to that game's rules, that game's player base, that game's meta, and I'm gonna have to adapt or die. The only time where comparing Halo and Call of Duty seems practical is when I'm talking about what I would rather spectate. Like, I would maybe rather watch good Halo players compared to good Call of Duty players because I think Halo requires more mechanical skill. Big whoop. Different games require different sets of skills and I wouldn't have it any other way. It's one of the reasons I love playing a wide variety of shooters. It's because when I go to play Insurgency, it challenges me in a way that Call of Duty doesn't. Call of Duty challenges me in a way that Halo doesn't. Halo challenges me in a way that Battlefield doesn't, you get it. Every game has its cheese, its meta, its high skill moves, its low skill moves, and I just don't really care to debate that because it's never going away, it's never going to change, and often people are just arguing these topics to sort of stand up for their favorite product or denounce somebody else's. Now let's talk about skill gaps, skill floors, and skill ceilings. For those of you that don't know what these terms mean, skill gap is sort of the catch-all. It's a metaphorical gap that's the distance between a novice player and an experienced player. A wide skill gap means that's gonna take longer. A shorter skill gap means it's not as hard to get good at the game. A low skill floor means the game is initially not as difficult, but a high skill floor means that just initially getting into the game can be quite difficult. And then skill ceiling is used to describe how high you can go up in terms of skill. A low skill ceiling means maybe there's not that much to master and there's not that big of a difference between a good and bad player. Whereas a high skill ceiling adds a lot of gradient and when you're at the top, it's much, much different than being at the bottom because there's a very you know long ways to go. So essentially a high skill ceiling game, sort of the sky's the limit. You can keep improving because there's so much to sink your teeth into. Really in-depth games have like really high skill ceilings and yeah. Outside of casual conversation, talking about this doesn't really matter. Again, it's an interesting topic, but staying on the better end of a short skill gap or the higher end of a short skill ceiling still requires dedication and practice to do the unthinkable. Stay there. At various times in my life, I have become a very high skill player in many different games and I'm going to tell you a lot of you can't tell by watching me play today because the hardest part is staying there. A subpar player becomes a shit player if they're not practicing and working hard, and the same goes for a well-experienced one. It's easy to atrophy and have to relearn games all over again. Instead of debating as to what has a low skill floor, or a high skill floor, or a 
skill ceiling or a skill gap, and who knows, maybe I even got one of the descriptions of one of those wrong. Instead of worrying about that, I like to picture skill as sort of balancing on a one inch beam. If a one inch beam is 10 feet high, or 30 feet high, or 50 feet high, it doesn't really matter once you're at the top. The hard part is not falling off. Somebody who's balancing on top of the 50 foot beam definitely took longer to get there and will take longer to get there again if they fall off. But again, the hardest part is staying there. If you do something in a very easy game or you use a very easy tactic, very easy character, but you master it, the hard part is staying there so that you can consistently perform at a high skill level. Trust me, it's not too hard to be really good at a game for two months or so, but you stop playing, you play other games, your fucking muscle memory goes away, your game sense goes away, your timing gets thrown off, your accuracy is thrown off, and suddenly you're back to square one. Staying there is the hard part, which is I think a big reason that we look up to esports players, because they're not just good at Call of Duty, they've been good at Call of Duty for like a decade or so, and that's pretty impressive. Then there's always the skill debate that surrounds broken or meta abuse things. Like in Call of Duty, because this is an easy example because it's a pretty mechanically easy game, you have stuff like quick scoping, slide canceling, snaking, and other movement techniques that, to a lot of people, separate the noobs from the pros because, well, if they require practice, they can't be critiqued as elements of the game, right? Now, if something that's clearly unintentional is breaking the game, defining the meta, defining a small part of the meta, defining high skill play, it doesn't just magically become above the topic of conversation. Again, if it seems unintentional and it's defining the meta, then I don't really care how much skill it takes to pull off. Like, take slide canceling in Call of Duty, for example. I don't think the developers intended you to enter my screen and then go from essentially a rapid crouch to a standing position while carrying momentum forward. Again, it's awkward to shoot at, and it really screws up aim assist, and I played a lot of Call of Duty on mouse and keyboard last year, and it really screws up those close range mouse gunfights. People will defend it though because it requires skill and requires time to practice at it in order to use it to its full advantage. Okay? I mean, these players, from what I've heard, wear out their controllers fast, they hurt their thumbs, they complain about that often, all while spending hours perfecting a movement input combo that is clearly unintentional from the developers. That's not magically above conversation because it takes a ton of skill. And again, if it takes a ton of skill, a ton of practice, a ton of workshopping and private matches and it's starting to hurt your thumb and it's wearing out your controller, you know, maybe you're taking advantage of a loophole in the movement inputs and it's not intentional. That's why it takes so much practice. I mean, video games, at the end of the day, especially Call of Duty, are very accessible. If you found something that requires, you know, weeks and weeks of practice to get right, you might have just found something that breaks the game. And if you look at slide canceling gameplay and you go, well, that's just normal, that's just high skill play. I, I don't know what to tell you because it's clearly unintentional. And I have another example of something like this we'll get to in a second, but I can use a close range gun at long range or vice versa because of my practice, but that still clearly isn't the intended idea. Using a close range SMG across the map or a snipe rifle two feet away, yeah, it's possible with practice and muscle memory, but that doesn't mean that's how the game should be played. Using it takes practice as a reason that it should be in the game doesn't make any sense. And it's funny because Call of Duty developers specifically have hampered quick scoping or hampered drop shotting or hampered slide canceling or snaking. Look up snaking, by the way. Tell me that's an intentional movement mechanic in Call of Duty games. You can see that they nerf it in a later title or they change it, they make it harder to do, and players start complaining because then they've made it too hard and it's like, well, maybe it was never supposed to be done in the first place. And it's a hard topic because usually the only defense the people that were taking advantage of it had was that it's a skill move. It takes a while to practice. It takes a while to get down. It requires muscle memory. Yeah, because you're supposed to change your elevation four times in a gunfight in Call of Duty. That's a skill move. Look, it took years for Call of Duty to nerf drop shotting, something that used to define high skill play. And now I wonder when the developers will have the guts to stand up to other gameplay breaking things 
and really strive to provide the gameplay loop that was intended from the beginning. Like abusing a movement loophole is how I see slide canceling, but a lot of people see it as something that requires practice, so they respect it. And again, if you practice at something that is a loophole that breaks the game, it defines the meta, that doesn't just give it a pass. People are going to argue about it, people are going to debate it, and if your only argument is, well, you're just bad and I'm really good, yeah. I don't think good is finding all the loopholes in the game and abusing them against players that maybe don't practice the game. I mean, again, a lot of these people that talk about their really high skill level are in public matches, meaning you're pairing up with people on their couch. It means you're pairing up with people that might just be hopping on for their first time in a week. And I want to know how many of these same high skill players bitch about skill-based matchmaking because they don't want to fight somebody their own level every time and turn the game into a job. Well, I'm sorry. If your idea of a good Call of Duty match is abusing movement loopholes and abusing weird mechanics to define the meta, then it's like you're already turning the game into a chore for everyone else. You might as well get matched up against people that go outside as little as you do. In my opinion, skill comes down to my original topic that this video is based off of, which is the FPS paradox. In order to have fun at the game, you're gonna have to be removing somebody else's fun, which means 50% of any match in like a Call of Duty game, a Halo match, a Battlefield match, is having less fun than the other half, or having no fun compared to the other half. Not a very fair system, but that's sort of the paradox. And I think a high skill player is somebody who isn't concerned about having fun. They're concerned with being an asset. They're concerned with getting better and learning. The fun for them doesn't come from winning a match. The fun for them comes from improving. The fun for them comes from being relied upon by their friends and teammates. When I was focusing on games, trying to get better at them as often as I could, it was always that. It was always that. In the back of my mind, I wanted to be the guy. The guy people could rely on. The guy people thought was better at the game. And the fun followed because of that. There was suddenly a little identity attached to my gameplay performance and there's the pride I needed. When you actually interface your pride with your gameplay, you have a pretty good alignment there. I don't want to do poorly, not because losing sucks, it's because I want everyone on my team to have a better time. I want to show myself that I've improved. And I think that's what a real high skill player is. Somebody who's able to employ that mentality and most of all, stay good. Again, doesn't matter how hard the task is, it's staying good at it. That's harder than a lot of people think. But at the end of the day, let me know what you think about these topics down below. I personally find them to be a headache. Like any comment I see saying that, well, I'm just a casual and my gameplay's not as good as theirs, so my opinion doesn't matter, it's like, well, you don't matter. Because I don't see your gameplay anywhere. You're in my comment section, so I don't even know how good you are. You could be blatantly lying just to defend your own contradictory point. I don't like skill debates. Especially with faceless people that I can't see their gameplay. So, whatever. I know that I'm not the best player in the world, but that's never been my goal. My goal is to be an asset, my goal is to have fun in a variety of shooters, and then talk about them with you guys. And I think I have uh, achieved that goal to some degree. See you when I see you guys. Goodbye.